Hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to give, get, get, I'll do, get started with intros and as we give folks another minute to sort of file into the virtual um, Zoom room. But for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Kendra Albert. Um, I'm the director of the Initiative for Representative First Amendment, or IFRA, um, which is the host organization um, for this panel today. Um, and I'm so, so excited to be hosting this conversation um, and basically getting to sit back and learn from this incredible group of panelists. Um, and I want to uh, just sort of like open with a couple of thank yous and then sort of tee off our topic and then I'll turn it over to Ahmed um, to actually run the, run the conversation. Um, but I first, before I get started, want to thank Khaled Beydoun and Afsana Ragot who provided um, both like logistical as well as uh, substantive support for planning this event. Really grateful, um, really grateful to them uh, for making sure that we knew could pull together this incredible, incredible group. Um, and I wanted to sort of say a little bit about IFRA's, how excited we are about this event and our support of this event. You know, when um, uh, the sort of more recent social media censorship of pro-Palestinian voices was happening, um, it was, not surprising to folks who had necessarily worked on social media censorship or surprising to folks who had worked on pro-Palestine uh, issues uh, advocacy before, but it, I think, resonated for the first time with a new group of people about how this might impact uh, advocacy online and who is being heard. Um, but of course, this work goes back a long way. I remember when I was actually sort of researching for putting together this panel, finding Palestine Legal's um, report from, I think it was 2015, on, uh, yeah, I'm seeing some nods, on what they call the Palestine exception to free speech law. Um, and so our goal with this event is to sort of maybe, I, I don't think in one hour we're gonna remedy the Palestine exception to free speech law, um, but to bring to folks who may come at this from more of a First Amendment angle, uh, some of the issues and uh, questions and uh, concerns that folks doing pro-Palestine advocacy have seen around uh, social media, but also offline speech censorship. And to do that, I'm super thrilled to introduce um, Ahmed Abuznid, um, who is the executive director of the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. Um, and he'll be moderating today, so I'm gonna get a, to take a back seat and listen and learn. Um, and I'll just be wrapping up at the end. Like with all IFRA events, please put questions in the Q&A um, box. And although we have such amazing panelists that we may only have time uh, for one or two uh, questions, um, we'll see if we can get there. But Ahmed, over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, thank you to Khaled Beydoun, uh, Josh Jot, uh, and everyone who's been a part of putting this together. Really excited for this conversation. Uh, once again, I'm Ahmed Abu Znaid. I direct the United States Campaign for Palestinian Rights, AKA USCPR. And um, one of the reasons I'm most excited about this conversation is I feel like we've had it um, you know, uh, a bit segregated. We've talked about offline stuff and we've talked about online stuff. And today we have a collection of individuals that are gonna help us put it all together and understand what's at stake for advocates uh, for the Palestinian cause, for Palestinians themselves, um, and the many ways we're seeking to, um, you know, disrupt this oppression by advocating for justice. So we're going to go around and actually ask for our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, what I'd like is for each of our colleagues here to say their name, um, where they're, um, you know, communicating to us from, and then a little bit about their organization and the work, so that folks can have the background context. Um, needed for when we get into these questions. And so I'm going to ask that we start with Diala first, and then we'll go to Radhika and then Nadine. Hi, so just introduction time, everyone. My name is Diala Shamas. Um, I'm a staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. We're a legal and advocacy organization based in New York. Um, I work on a range of issues at CCR, but sort of generally at the intersection of what's called national security law and um, and sort of human rights law or immigration law. A lot of my work has been around um, Palestinian rights, whether it's defending Palestinian advocacy here in the US or um, working with Palestinians sort of um, on the ground in the West Bank, Gaza and in Israel. Thank you, Diala. Radhika? 
Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Radhika Sinoth. I'm a senior staff attorney at Palestine Legal. I'm based in our New York City office. We work closely with the Center for Constitutional Rights in Diala. Um, for those of you who don't know much about Palestine Legal, we um, are basically legal defense for Palestine activists in the United States. We provide legal support for people who are censored, punished, falsely accused um, for speaking out for Palestinian rights, and I oversee our intake and casework. Thank you, Radhika. Nadim. Hi, everybody. My name is Nadim Nashef. I'm the director of Hamle. Hamle is a Palestinian digital rights organization um, that works uh, to defend and promote digital, Palestinian digital rights, uh, basically through uh, monitoring and researching uh, the policies uh, and the actions of the different three governments, the Israeli government, the Palestinian Authority, and the de facto Hamas government in Gaza Strip. Uh, we also do uh, similar work in front of the internet companies, specifically the social media companies and the digital economy companies and their policies towards Palestinians. And we do work with the Palestinian civic society to empower them on digital advocacy tools. Thank you, Nadim. So I'm going to actually stay uh, with you here for this first question, uh, and then we'll get to get a chance to hear from Radhika and Diala. Nadim, what have we seen over the last few months that's felt different to you, and what has been more of the same? Yeah, so before speaking about the difference, I think it's important uh, to, to see the picture in general that there is an ongoing fight, fight and war on narratives. Uh, there is an ongoing in the last few years an attempt to suppress Palestinian voices on the online um, and this takes in many shapes and forms but uh, it's important to understand that uh, there is a systematic effort that has been going on in the last few years um, and the Israeli government has been uh, using different tactics and strategies to to implement this um, part of this is are legislations that criminalize uh, human rights defenders and Palestinian activists. Part of this, uh, of this is developing and encouraging a, a whole industry of surveillance uh, against Palestinians. Palestinians in the last few years have been a kind of a laboratory uh, for uh, the Israeli security establishment and Israeli companies to develop these technologies that actually later on are sold uh, abroad, uh, including to some of the Arab regimes. We know the infamous company of NSO and uh, Anivision and others. Um, other kind of tactics and strategies that they were used uh, is basically to put heavy pressure on social media companies to adapt their own definition of incitement and their own definition of what is terrorism and what is uh, um, kind of not uh, legitimate uh, uh, speak on the, those platforms. Other tactics that have been used in the last years is to organize different groups. Um, we uh, kind of Congos, basically governmentally supported NGOs um, that are uh, supported financially and also coordinated like ACT IL, uh, 4IL and others that basically together they do mass reporting on Palestinian uh, content, uh, even without understanding what's the content about or knowing the language. And obviously, uh, uh, publishing lots of uh, pages and uh, uh, content that is supporting the Israeli uh, narrative as an opposite to all what they have, have been doing with the Palestinian narrative. Um, so, so this is normally what's happening, and this is the, the fight or the war that's happening in the last year on the narrative. But on the other hand, uh, what we saw uh, in May, it's, uh, it's the same war, but in, in steroids. So basically, uh, uh, heavy pressure on the companies, the Israeli cyber unit working, um, I mean, according to the director of that unit, they had um, seven times more requests of takedowns uh, from the companies than what they are you do, usually doing. Um, and to understand that the, the Israeli cyber unit under the Israeli Ministry of Justice um, through the different uh, secretive agencies, they are systematically, as, as I mentioned, uh, surveilling Palestinian social media and basically asking for takedowns take or what's so-called uh, voluntary takedowns um, without any due process uh, uh, regarding Palestinian content. And this is what happened in May basically was like, uh, you know, as happening usually, but uh, in, in, in so many 
uh, on so much more uh, cases. I mean, Hamla Center alone uh, documented 600 cases in three weeks. Uh, we assume that there were thousands of cases. So basically everything was uh, uh, amplified in, in, that, uh, in that time. Uh, and all of these kind of directly from the Israeli government or whether it's uh, like NGOs that are related and supported by the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs or other groups who are intensif intensifying their work uh, to suppress the Palestinian voices in that time. Thank you, Nadim, and thank you for the work of Hamle uh, to be able to give us some data um, and some chances to learn from some of these um, uh, tactics of suppression. So I'd love to uh, shift over to uh, you know our folks based in the U.S. Um, let's have Diallo go first, and then we can get to Radhika. Sure, um, and I'll just step back even one more bit because I'm not sure what level of familiarity folks in the audience have uh, around this just general situation on, on the ground in Palestine. But it, in some, what we have been seeing in the, in, the late, um, in, in the latest months has been fairly unprecedented um, uprisings in uh, not just where we're sort of more used to seeing them, whether it's the West Bank or Gaza, but also in Israel, right, in, um, in the, um, what we call, what Palestinians call 48. Um, so uh, areas where Palestinians who live there are citizens of Israel. And where we've been seeing, um, I think in many ways, uh, unprecedented connection of the, the issues that affect and impact Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinians in the West Bank, both occupied territory um, and, and Palestinians in, in 48. And, um, and a sort of moving beyond the usual international law narratives that have really focused on the law of occupation and speaking much more about, um, you know, fundamental questions of equality and justice. So that's just like a really big <laughs> background to, to how, what, what we're seeing. Um, so it feels like an opening in many ways. Um, and then with, with, with new audiences too, right? People are, hearing the message differently um, globally for coming out of Palestine. Um, and, and a lot of this was sparked by um, events in Jerusalem as the sort of process of um, the, the, the Israeli government policy of uh, essentially uh, what we call ethnically cleansing or removing Palestinians from uh, neighborhoods in East Jerusalem was reaching a fever pitch in a couple of neighborhoods. Sheikh Jarrah provided sort of a, uh, it's a neighborhood in East Jerusalem provided like a sort of particular example of this as they were facing some uh, what are called eviction proceedings, forced eviction proceedings in Israeli courts, um, but also uh, efforts to um, uh, just uh, massive marches by Israeli far right groups onto Jerusalem and then solidarity from Palestinians in Gaza, uh, you know, in, in response to these or viewed our assaults on Palestinians in Jerusalem. So that's all, you know, there, there's, there's been a lot of social media advocacy around these flashpoints, right? Places like Sheikh Jarrah, places like the old city of Jerusalem. And then of course, um, inevitably with the massive Israeli military assault on Gaza um, and uh, civilian deaths, um, seeing the sort of social media around that. So with this increased attention, you see the increased repression of, um, of efforts to go beyond, um, to, to have Palestinian voices reach you know, outside of the usual mainstream media. Those efforts feel, um, relatively successful considering the amount of uh, repression that's faced and generally how these voices really make it to uh, more mainstream media channels. And so I think that a lot of the suppression that we're seeing is in direct response to that kind of increased attention. Um, another thing that seems different has been, you know, Nadim mentioned the way that social media companies have been uh, removing content in large part at, at the request of, you know, organized efforts by the Israeli government. Um, what we've seen on the U.S. side is how these efforts to get, they, they, they sort of, I mean, this is a, to, to summarize really, like uh, two main, two main like directions that this has taken. 
One is, and they're both longstanding, but again, as Nadine mentioned, kind of on uh, steroids more recently, uh, the use of the sort of anti-Semitism framework as a way, uh, and particularly the pushing of particular definitions of anti-Semitism that equate any criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism and hoping that social media companies and third parties, uh, third party platforms adopt this redefinition of anti-Semitism. Um, oftentimes we'll hear about it referred to as the IHRA. I'm hoping Radhika can get into that a little bit more. Um, and so that's kind of one way in which this is done. So we're seeing, you know, very active efforts to get these social media companies to adopt these, um, these definitions, um, which then justify the removal of content that is critical of Zionism, of Israeli government policies, and so on. Um, and then the other direction that we're seeing, um, again, increase is the use of anti-terrorism laws or regulations um, and the weaponization of these U.S. anti-terrorism regulations um, to, to remove content from social media platforms. And that's not the only ways, and I'll talk a little bit more in, in, in the ways in which anti-terrorism laws are being used um, online and offline to suppress Palestinian speech, but I just kind of want to flag these two things. Thank you so much, Diala. Uh, Radhika, you're up. Sounds good. Um, so, you know, sort of along the lines of what Diala mentioned, you know, in Palestine, right? So you have a situation where Palestinians for over 70 years have been living in a situation of, you know, uh, colonialism and apartheid um, and ethnic cleansing. And um, here in the United States, you know, people have been speaking out in support of Palestinian rights um, and against, you know, ethnic cleansing and, um, and the political ideology of Zionism. And what we've seen in Palestine Legal um, over the past few years, you know, we started in 2013, is that the movement for Palestinian rights has largely been um, student-led. Um, and this makes sense um, if, you know, if you think about sort of US history and who leads social justice movements from the civil rights era to you know, the, the Vietnam anti-war um, anti movement to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa in the 1980s, often students were on the sort of cutting edge of, um, of activism and sort of free speech, right? And so when Palestine Legal started, you know, we started to, um, to be here for anyone whose who's, who's, um, free speech was censored because of a principled speech supporting Palestinian rights in the United States. But we, what we found was that um, about 80%, like the vast majority of people who came to us were either students or professors. Um, and, you know, in some ways this really made sense, you know, where, where change is happening, where, where, where the activism was, was also where the suppression was. Um, and so, you know, in some ways it's, it's, it's exciting to see this growing movement of Palestinian rights. You know, I just want to like zoom out a little bit and not be all negative. Like, um, it is incredible to see how, how I feel like the tide is changing in the United States. You know, I, I'm not normally like so positive <laughs> living in the United States when it comes to Palestinian freedom. Um, and I will just say, you know, I've been an activist on this issue for um, almost 20 years now. I lived in Palestine during the second intifada in 2002 and 2003 for about a year and a half. I lived in Gaza for a few months as well. Um, so I've been involved in this issue for, for um, a long time now. So what I've really noticed in the past, you know, since May, um, some things that have changed here in Palestine Legal that we've been seeing um, is that people are speaking out more and it's not just people who might call themselves activists. It's not just those student activists or those progressive groups. It's not lefty professors purely. Um, you know, we track incidents of suppression. Um, and since 2014, when we started tracking these numbers, we've responded to over 1700 incidents of suppression. Um, and that, by that, I mean, it's just really what people come to us and report. Um, so that's just really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so we've seen some patterns um, over time, but what we really saw um, recently is, is sort of what I'm gonna call regular people <laughs> getting censored and punished. So it's not like just leftists or people who kind of know what's up when it comes to speaking up for Palestinian rights in the United States. You know, we've been getting calls from farmers, from, you know, doctors and healthcare workers, um, you know, people who work in, in fashion and beauty. I mean, big law, like private sector, publishing, media, like you name it. Um, because people come to us confidentially, I can't share with you all of these stories, but some of them are 
really high profile to just sort of, you know, regular people trying to go about their daily lives who um, are really upset and horrified by what is happening in Palestine and maybe are new to the issue and hadn't really understood what, what was happening there and felt compelled to speak out about it on social media often, or sometimes it's really just in their workplace. Um, and then they're called in by their bosses. They're told you need to delete all of your tweets supporting Palestinian rights, um, or they're fired, or they're told, um, hey, um, and you know, in a couple of cases, we've, we've had people who deal in mental or health services. And, um, you know, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the uprisings last year, um, they found that their employers, you know, put out statements in support of Black lives, or in the wake of um, the hate crimes in Atlanta, the anti-Asian hate crimes, um, you know, their offices were, were trying to be supportive of, of their Asian clientele. Um, and so they were like, oh, you know, now I have the space to do this for Palestinians. Some of them are Palestinian, Palestinians themselves. And then they find that, oh, wait, there's this Palestine exception to free speech, right? Now there's complaints. Um, and so they call us. Um, so, so, so those are some of the changes that we're seeing here. And, you know, the move from like sort of like public censorship, uh, which is still very much there. You know, I don't want to say it's not there. Um, but we're really seeing sort of like regular people get involved um, in, 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 in speaking out for Palestinian rights and getting censored and punished for that. So that's one trend we're seeing. Thank you so much. So Radhika, we're going to stay with you uh, and uh, we'll have you lead off answering this next question, which is uh, what are some of the ways we've seen success in defending uh, freedom of speech on the issue of Palestine? I will say just getting that message out that there is a free speech issue and talking about Palestine, right? And I just want to say the report um, that Kendra mentioned in the beginning, we, we co-authored it with the Center for Constitutional Rights. So it wasn't just Palestine legal, but that did come out in 2015. So six years ago, and that was like, no one had used that phrase. Like, I think, you know, Palestinians knew what was up and some, you know, people really, you know, involved in the issue knew what's up as far as the censorship and how hard it is to, to talk about Palestine in the United States. But um, I feel like that's in the lexicon now more. Um, not, I, I mean, we need to, we really need to get that, that message out more. There's still a lot of problems, a sort of a both sides sort of framing of it, which is, which doesn't recognize the power imbalance at all. But I think, I think those are some successes as far as just lawyers' successes. Um, but I also want to just bring it back to the activists, because like, you know, we're lawyers, we, we, we try to defend activists, but I just really think, um, you know, uh, you know, Palestinians have done amazing as far as just like continuing to resist. And I think the activists here in the United States are really just growing the movement and just getting the message out. And I think we should be, we have a long way to go, but um, I feel like the growth has just been exponential. Um, and especially um, if you look at like the younger generation, like millennials and younger, um, on college campuses, like it, there's just been a sea change. Absolutely. I share your excitement, Radhika. Um, we are shifting hearts and minds and thoughts daily. So Diella, uh, you know, uh, Radhika touched a little bit about legal and activist success we've seen, but uh, particularly on the legal strategies, um, you all have uh, served as counsel for the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, and we were obviously being sued. Um, you spoke about material support to terrorism. So, um, you know, what are some, some su successful ways that we've been able to battle, um, you know, for this freedom of speech on Palestine? And, and in particular, you can touch a little bit on the, the lawsuit. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And let me talk a little bit about that lawsuit because um, it's pretty emblematic of what uh, one form of the many uh, forms of attacks on Palestinian advocacy that we've seen. And just noting, because in the chat, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, the sort of the fact that there's plenty of, of, uh, of f Jewish Americans who are um, also being attacked. So when we, when we talk about Palestinian advocacy, um, I think we're talking about advocacy for Palestinian rights and the speakers are oftentimes not just, you know, Palestinian, they're um, all sorts of speakers, right? So that's a really important point to note. But um, the, the US campaign uh, lawsuit is a really interesting one for several reasons. In addition to the fact that we have an amazing client, uh, it was brought by 
um, the Jewish National Fund, which is, and as well as some other individual plaintiffs who are all Israeli um, individuals. The Jewish National Fund um, is a sort of, in Israel, it's a quasi-state agency. In other words, it has legislatively acquired status where it sort of acts um, as a partial, partially in control of significant swaths of land, around 10% of the land in uh, in, 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 Is in Israel, um, the part that was established in 1948. Um, and so they have also international fundraising branches. I'm sure people are familiar with the little blue boxes across, across the US, very familiar in many Jewish communities. But the statute under which the, the lawsuit was brought is the US material support to terrorism statute, which is a criminal law. And then the civil provisions um, of JASTA, J-A-S-T-A, the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, I believe, which allows individuals um, to bring civil suits against, um, among others, uh, folks who are who the plaintiffs accuse of providing material support to terrorism. So under this theory, um, which we've seen a lot being used against banks, um, Iranian banks, Lebanese banks, um, by victims of terrorism. That's kind of been like the first gen of a lot of that litigation and it's still very much ongoing and it's a pretty big multi-million billion dollar industry probably. Um, the sort of next gen of, of these lawsuits are uh, being brought against uh, organizations like the US campaign. And so the allegations are meritless. Um, and in fact, the judge agreed with us. The, the Jewish National Fund claims harms to some of its trees that it planted along the Gaza border. The harm has come from the incendiary kites and balloons that Palestinian protesters and marchers in Gaza launched um, as part of the Great Return March, which was a, um, a series of marches planned um, by, by um, sort of vast swath of, of organizations and individuals in Gaza demanding the right to return of uh, the refugee the right to return of Palestinian refugees and um, that some of those incendiary kites and balloons and rockets launched from Gaza into Israel have burned some of the JNF trees and some of the plaintiff's property and so that is the harm that is alleged um, and because the U.S. campaign which is a DC-based uh, advocacy organization um, that does all sorts of amazing work had um, fiscally sponsored the boycott uh, committee, which is uh, it, based in, in Palestine, that boycott through, de through a six degrees of separation theory, um, they are trying to sort of ping liability for the trees that were burnt, um, uh, on, the JNF trees that were burnt onto the US campaign. So I tried my best to give the summary of a, what is a fairly elaborate and um, frankly absurd set of allegations. Um, but the purpose of these lawsuits, and this is kind of to the broader point, is to silence and to chill and to deviate resources away from the important work that organizations like the US campaign are doing to sort of defending um, and putting them in a posture where they have to sort of address these various terrorism allegations. And that is the crux of what we're seeing in so many contexts, right? Sort of constantly lobbying these allegations of terrorism against anything that Palestinians say or do and distracting from the real issues on the ground that Palestinians are trying to talk about, right? The disposition of their lands or historic dispossession um, and, and their, uh, their quest for justice. So after, you know, we filed a motion to dismiss, um, the, the judge agreed and granted the motion to dismiss. And of course, because this is about exhausting resources, um, the JNF, the motion to reconsider that is pending and so we continue to move forward we're pretty confident um, but that doesn't take away from the uh the distraction and their resources and that's really kind of the the point of these these laws and, and sort of the material support to terrorism civil provisions um so the ability of any kind of individual to bring a claim and lodge a complaint in a federal court that sounds in terrorism, which is one of those like boogeyman words. It's very scary. It takes the air out of the room when people hear it. Um, it's a big problem because even though not uh, a lot of these cases aren't necessarily making it to court, but CCR and Palestine Legal and many others know that organizations working on Palestinian rights, 
um, donors who are trying to support Palestinian rights, um, uh, academics, journalists, are, are, you know, folks who are basically being targeted by this network of Nadim called gongos, right? Um, organizations that are like NGOs that are sort of sub affiliated closely with the Israeli government have an explicit mandate and purpose of um, of uh, silencing uh, support for ad of Palestinian rights. Lodge threat letters constantly, right? There's a very um, active, uh, and this doesn't make it on a court's docket, so you're not seeing it necessarily, but we're hearing a lot about it because people come to us, frankly, panicked. Um, about you know their potential liability, and uh, they're not used to hearing you know these words material support to terrorism, um, and they certainly um, have nothing to do with any of that. But they are simply trying to advocate for Palestinian rights, and so so it ends up being a, a lot of time and resources simply doing this defense work of advising people of what to do, trying to make sure that everything um, um, that that people are continuing continue to be able to. So whether it's fundraise or advocate or um, travel and do the things that they want to be doing to keep highlighting the sort of injustices on the ground in Palestine um, when faced with these kinds of allegations and these lawsuits. And a lot of these kinds of, uh, these lawsuits are also on the minds of in-house counsel at every social media company that you all know about. And um, you know, recently you all probably heard um, Zoom removed events by um, by a, a, that, that involved a, a number of Palestinian speakers. Uh, likely, and we don't know this, but you know, this 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 idea that you're going to be maybe sued or maybe found liable under some various laws is sort of like in the back of everything, but it's rarely surfaced and explicitly addressed. When it is, and when it has been it's always been shot down by courts, right? And I think I'd love it if Radhika could say more about the sort of equivalent pattern we're seeing in the anti-BDS legislation, right? I mean, it's it's not something, the, the chill is way more significant than the actual concrete impact of legislations and lawsuits. Um, it's the fact that people know that it's out there, but they haven't really fully had a chance to um, understand the sort of details of it. And that makes people want to not even approach or touch the, the whole issue. Yeah, thank you, Deyala. Uh, obviously, you all see we have brilliant counsel, and I'm thankful. Uh, Radhika, uh, do you want to address that point uh, right now before we head over to Nadim? Sure, on the on the legislation um, side of things. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, since 2014, 220 bills have been introduced in the United States um, targeting speech um, supporting Palestinian rights, most of them targeting the boycott movement for Palestinian rights. Um, now, most of those failed, actually. Only um, 23 of those bills actually passed. No, I'm sorry, about 23% of those passed. Um, but we, right now in the United States, we have 31 states with bills in effect, um, which is kind of nuts, right? On the other hand, um, you know, boycotts are protected, First Amendment protected speech in the United States. Um, there's a case from 1981, NAACP v. Clay Claiborne Hardware, um, where the Supreme Court made that crystal clear, right? So um, because of that, you know, when we first saw these bills being introduced, you know, they tried to do things like, um, anti-Palestinian groups tried to do things like, you know, if you allow uh, an academic organization to pass um, a resolution supporting the academic boycott of Israel, um, we can defund your entire state school system of all funds. Like there were these really crazy things, right? And, you know, um, thanks to organizing efforts, including with like teachers unions and, and different kinds of groups, including a lot of Jewish groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, um, those bills were increasingly watered down to where we right now have these bills, which are just like, I mean, here in the state of New York, for example, um, Governor Cuomo signed an executive order which says, um, oh, you know, all companies who um, support BDS, you know, we're going to make a blacklist and then New York's not going to do business with them. And if you look at the blacklist, this was in 2016, it's like 10 companies, they're all European. No one's really heard of them. It's not really clear if they do any business with 
with New York, it's not even clear if they engage in BDS. No, you know, and and everyone in New York who wants to support bo boycotts for Palestinian rights can continue and go about their business and do it as they should, because it is their, their free speech right to do that. But I will say at the beginning, people were really confused and we got a lot of calls. And even today, we still get calls and usually maybe it's, um, you know, from people who are newer to the issue or community members, Palestinian community members that are not sure. Um, and I think that's really the purpose behind passing these laws or bringing these lawsuits as Diala mentioned. Um, there's all kinds of complaints that are, that are being brought in, in various contexts. Um, that have lost. And one of the architects of, of the complaint process, one of these bringing civil rights complaints to stop Palestinian rights, his name is Kenneth Marcus. Um, he was formerly in the Trump administrations as, as the head of their office for civil rights. And back before that, um, before he was in that position, he was he wrote an op-ed um, in the Jerusalem Post where he said, you know, it might seem demoralizing that we anti-Palestinian groups are losing all of these complaints. But rest assured, you know, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, he said, you know, there's still these complaints are still having their purpose because no one wants to be the target of a civil rights complaint. And because we are bringing these 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 complaints, you know, people are afraid to, to join Students for Justice in Palestine and they're afraid to speak out. Um, so I think really, ultimately, at the end of the day, that is what these groups are trying to do. They're trying to scare people from speaking up for Palestinian freedom and chill people because it can be scary to be a target of these types of lawsuits or falsely accused of terrorism or anti-Semitism for taking a principled position for Palestinian rights. Thank you, thank you. And so just for everyone, before I move to Nadim, uh, these are organizations well worthy of your donation. Uh, Diala and CCR have obviously served as uh, counsel for us. Um, and then of course for Pal Legal, I've reached out to them several times personally when I was being defamed um, and targeted by different um, you know, Zionist outlets. So uh, we're going to go ahead and shift to Nadim. Nadim, you um, posted a report for us here in the chat that I shared with everyone. I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit about the report and also some of the successes that Hamla has seen in, in engaging this issue over the last few months. Yeah, so, so basically in the last uh, few months, we have been uh, documenting uh, all the, these kind of the takedowns that I was uh, talking about. And this report basically covers them and uh, cover how uh, the companies also react to our appeal. So basically, Hamley is a trusted partner of these social media companies. As you know, so these social media companies normally, they need uh, different uh, stakeholders from the civil society and the different countries they operate and they want people whom they can consult. Uh, um, and basically, we, we uh, try to document all these cases and to appeal. Uh, and try to put them back. Um, um, but also in the same time, I want to share with you uh, uh, another report, which we basically did uh, during this time together with uh, actually an Israeli company. We were uh, also observing the, the incitement and what was happening on the other side, basically. Um, because what's happening is that um, there is this uh, feeling that this is not being addressed at all um, so it's a situation where basically the cyber unit, uh, like 95% of their work in the Israeli Ministry of Justice is to track and to monitor Palestinian content and to, to try to take it down as much as possible. On the other hand, we know that there are these kind of very extreme right-wing fascist groups who were uh, organizing these attacks in the mixed cities like uh, Haifa, Ramli, Led, um, Acker, and other places that, that Diala mentioned earlier. Um, so, so these attacks were organized and synchronized and through these chat applications uh, and through these uh, Facebook. Um, and, and there was this uh, huge amount of, uh, of, uh, of racism and insight that basically this kind of is, is free, free, basically. I mean, the, the, the message that the Israeli government uh, is sending that if you are an Israeli Jewish, you are allowed uh, to incite as much as you want because nobody will really like the, the law enforcement would not happen with you all the time that you are inciting against Palestinians and, and, and Arabs. So out of the million conversations, million, 1 million 90 uh, conversations that we monitored in these three weeks, there was around 183 um, conversations, around 80% basically of the conversations that mentioned Arabs and Palestinians in these three weeks 
were including hate speech, racism, and incitement. So you can imagine like the, the high level uh, of volume of, of, of this hate speech that nobody really uh, deal with or uh, address. Um, on the other hand, I also want to uh, speak about the issue of like the successes and the, the shifts that we are seeing uh, in this period. As a person who um, was following social media content uh, moderation uh, of the, these different platforms, I, I think that there is a change. I mean, things are not the same as they were in 2015 and 14, uh, where basically we had like total, uh, I mean, they totally ignored us in, the, in these platforms. Um, and specifically in the last uh, period, uh, in the last aggression, the Israeli aggression, I mean, we saw lots of uh, Arab and international influencers on the social media who were uh, stepping forward and saying and being vocal about uh, Palestinians and justice uh, that should be happening on the social media. We saw lots of uh, uh, also different people uh, organizing themselves and speaking out and uh, trying to, to, to be there and to influence in different languages. We saw international solidarity more and more. Um, also from the global south, not only from Europe and the US, um, uh, that was happening, which is uh, uh, was not the case. For example, if I compare like 2014, etc., uh, these phenomena hardly uh, existed. There, there was much more uh, by the mainstream media coverage, rega specifically regarding the content moderation policies, um, uh, articles and reports that were criticizing. Uh, 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 Facebook and the other companies that they were talking about these kind of mob lynches in the streets of uh, the mixed cities. Um, but, I mean, this was covered by the New York Times um, uh, and uh, reports in Washington Post and other mainstream media outlets, which was hardly existing before. So, so all of this, I think, created pressure, certain pressure on the social media companies. And specifically, I can speak about Facebook that they were much more apologetic than before. They were trying to excuse things and to explain things. So we saw, for example, the phenomena of shadow banning, uh, this phenomena where the reachability of the, of the account and the pages was dropping suddenly when they start speaking about Palestine. That was not ha happening before, especially with influencers. Um, and uh, about uh, hashtags that disappear, Al-Aqsa hashtag, for example, on Instagram disappeared before three days. Uh, so later on, uh, the head of Instagram, they, they published this uh, PR communicate uh, saying that there was a glitch and there was a technical problem and it's a global one and it's not related to Palestine, etc. cetera, um, which obviously was not true. Uh, but just the issue of them speaking about what's happened and trying to explain and uh, having these meetings with different stakeholders and then having meetings with Israeli officials, but then after that having meetings with uh, Mohammed Shtay, the Palestinian prime minister. Uh, so all of these things that normally do not happen, they happened now and we see a shift. Now, it's obviously not the breakthrough that we want. I mean, we really want a just transparent policy of uh, uh, equal policy of content moderation and not just, you know, kind of excuses. Um, and we, we are not there, but I, I we see that there are changes that are happening. They are small, they are slow, um, but things are changing, at least comparing for, with a couple of years ago. Thank you, Nadine. So appreciative of the work Hamla is doing. I think just the, 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 the ability to be able to talk about it with the data to back it up is incredibly helpful for us as advocates. Um, so we had a question come through the Q&A that uh, actually situates perfectly with a question we wanted to ask. So I'll lift up the question from the audience member and then tie it in and I'm gonna hand off to Diallo. Uh, so the question was, um, let's see, here we are. Can one use material supports terrorism against settler funding, fundraising organizations like the JNF, you know, such as they were doing against USCPR? And so we also had a question we were gonna engage with around you know, how do we develop an offensive strategy or how do we go on the offensive against all of these mechanisms? So I'm going to hand off to Diala and then we'll get to the rest of our colleagues. Diala. Yeah, great. It's my favorite kind of question, um, both because it allows us to talk about um, some of the problems with the using the terrorism framework, right, and not wanting to um, strengthen it. And like, I, you know, ultimately, 
material support to terrorism laws and various US terrorism laws are, if you look at the way that they're being deployed, widely being deployed against communities of color, um, enforced in ways that are discriminatory and uh, chilling, right? So if you look at the material support to terrorism statute, um, which as it currently stands um, after the United Supreme Court uh, addressed a constitutional challenge in Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, um, essentially plaintiffs in that case were a number of mostly humanitarian um, and peace building organizations saying we would love to uh, we want uh, we want to be um, engaging with um, uh, and and sort of providing legal training to organizations that are on the U.S. terrorism list, like the Tamil Tigers, right? So can we provide them training on international law and how not to run afoul to international humanitarian law, for example? Um, but we're afraid to do so because there's this law in the books, and um, to us it feels like we might be running afoul to this criminal law. And the Supreme Court, unfortunately, in a very unfortunate decision, upheld the constitutionality of that statute and essentially kept this really broad definition of material support to terrorism, which has largely um, chilled uh, certain forms of uh, charitable work, important, crucial, life-giving forms of humanitarian work in areas where um, where the where uh, organizations that are designated by the U.S. government as terrorist organizations operate, so Afghanistan, Somalia, uh, uh, certainly Gaza, uh, with Hamas, and most Palestinian political parties are designated under the U.S. Uh, terrorism system. So anything that props that up is uh, is is generally something that. I would seriously question. Um, in fact, a lot of our work, and one of the things that I think we really need to be engaging with, as um, especially if there are folks here who are interested in sort of the First Amendment, in civil liberties, um, and sort of putting their legal minds to work around these issues, is how do we start dismantling that regime because of how um, how silencing and damaging it has been to some communities and not others. Now, that is not to say that we shouldn't be thinking about creative ways to um, hold accountable a lot of these groups and these individuals and these organizations that are directly involved in violating Palestinian rights. And, um, and that's really where I, I want us to be spending <laughs> our time. I mean, we're stuck doing the defense work, unfortunately, but I'd like to at least be doing 50% of my time of also kind of keeping the focus on where we want it to be and not just just not just defending against false accusations, but also turning the tables and putting the shining the light back onto where it needs to be, which is on um, what Palestinians are saying and what Palestinians are demanding. And a big part of that has been, what are you in the US doing supporting all of these organizations on the ground in Palestine um, that are, and you know, and in Israel and in, in Jerusalem, which is occupied, um, that are driving the settler movement, that are actively involved in dispossessing people from their homes. Like these are U.S. individuals, U.S. organizations, and so, so we're we're very actively thinking about that, um, not using the terrorism laws um, because, again, we don't want to sort of prop those up and validate them. But we, but there are various other laws um, that are underutilized, right? And certainly the US has international law obligations. And I think now, even though some of this stuff may have fallen on deaf, ear, deaf ears, is that the right idiom? Yes, um, my idioms are sometimes off. The, oh, so, you know, some years ago, now, now we, we have more of an audience, whether it's, um, whether it's in Congress. Um, and I think also there's just, the, the developments on the ground also make it so that we have just like very clear evidence of this kind of direct engagement. Um, so yeah, that's where, that's, that's my happier place. Um, and I, 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 I'm really glad for the question, um, but I do also just in terms of engaging folks around thinking of not just how, what do we need to be do, to, doing to defend Palestinian rights, but also how do we dismantle a regime of, um, basically the sort of post 9-11 war on terror uh, world, right? How do we move on from that? Because if you look at the regulations and the laws that have been passed like the material support to terrorism law, 
um, they've been weaponized against advocacy for Palestinian rights and other forms of advocacy. Um, Muslim charitable giving has been a huge area of concern for many civil liberties organizations for a long time and it's, it's under these laws. Most folks who talk about it are like in the humanitarian space, in the charitable space, um, and not so much in the uh, cyber space and in the human rights space and in the like advocacy space. And I think we need to sort of start changing that even though it sounds scary, terrorism laws are scary. Like we have to be like looking at the, their impacts on, on um, the work on the ground. Thank you, Diala. So uh, I wanna say uh, shout, out to, shout out to the Institute for Representative First Amendment because uh, we have a great um, audience with us with a lot of questions. Sadly, we won't be able to address them all, but Radhika, one question lifted up that relates to this question is about the Florida uh, the Florida State lawsuit that Pal Legal has launched. Um, can you share with us a, a bit about that effort? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, um, one way we sort of recently went on the offensive along those that those lines is that we're representing um, a Florida State University student named Ahmed. Daraldik, and he's Palestinian, first Palestinian American um, to be Florida State Student Senate. Um, really incredible, brilliant young guy. Um, and when he got elected, um, anti-Palestinian groups, including mostly off-campus groups, dug through his social media profile um, and found statements where he cursed um, Israel's occupation when he was a child. Um, and other statements that he made as a child. And he lived in Palestine, was tear gassed when he was a kid there, like remembers um, having to protect a younger sister who had asthma when um, the Israeli army threw tear gas canisters in their house. Um, so yeah, he cursed the occupation. Um, and because of that, I mean, he was subjected to just a, a storm of like incredibly racist, harassing um, social media um, comments um, mentioning his family and his aunts and, you know, the N-word and um, just horrific things um, that no one should have to go through, much less a student um, who's, who's um, trying to support the community. And, um, and the administration, instead of helping him, actually condemned his speech. And they put out a statement, the president of the university put up a, a statement um, on FSU's website, first condemning him as um, anti-Israel and then mysteriously and sort of quietly changed anti-Israel to anti-Semitic. Um, and so, you know, we, we, you know, we tried to help him for months. Um, he, he eventually got removed and then he got put back. Um, and this was, you know, during, during, <laughs> during the COVID pandemic. Um, and eventually, you know, we filed a complaint um, recently and this is, we just learned it was actually the first of the, its kind um, a Title VI complaint um, alleging anti-Palestinian um, hostile environment. Um, and so Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, came out of the civil rights movement. And the idea behind that, this was during a time when, you know, Black students in the United States were facing nooses and really horrific racist um, acts so that they, they couldn't get an education, right? And so um, under this under this law, a university can lose its federal funding if it allows a hostile environment to take place that's so severe and pervasive, um, a student can't get an education. Um, and uh, you know that that's really what happened here with Ahmed. Um, and so we filed the first complaint um, on his behalf. We're waiting to see what happens with that. It, it takes a few it takes a months long process. But you know what we're hearing more of from students. We're hearing, you know, this is a free speech issue. We do believe that this isn't just about sort of Palestinians, right? It's really anyone who speaks out for Palestinian rights in the United States is treated differently and is censored and punished. And um, an enormous number of people who come to us are also actually Jewish and often Jewish Israelis. Um, but I think what we're really seeing recently is Palestinians um, who are speaking out um, on behalf of their families, who are talking about their lived experiences as Palestinians being targeted in particularly discriminatory and harassing ways. And so we're trying to use this, this, this law and this complaint process to, to try to get them relief and to draw attention to the situation so that universities um, don't think that they can just get away with, with throwing Palestinian students under the bus because um, because of pressure from anti-Palestinian pro-Israeli groups. Thank you, Radhika. Yeah, and, and also as another Ahmed that went to Florida State University, I really, really appreciate you all uh, supporting 
young Ahmed there. So we, we have just a, a couple of minutes left. I'm wondering if our panelists want to um, address anything they didn't get a moment to address, and then maybe just point to things that people can do to support. So Nadim, I'm going to kick it off to you first. What can folks do to support uh, this advocacy? Yeah, so, so I think um, I mean, in, in this world of online, it's very important to, to take part and to, to share materials and to raise awareness. I think we saw this uh, in the last uh, period, how much this uh, was influential and how much we, we, we raised the voice and we, we were more vocal than the usual and uh, um, we created enough um, enough pressure, let's say, also on the companies to, to, to think twice that their usual policies of silencing us and uh, colluding with the Israeli government wouldn't, wouldn't work as uh, smooth as it usually does. And that's why, again, I mean, I think we all have the role in this and raising awareness and coordinating and organizing and putting more pressure on the companies. I think to, to share the materials and as things are really like, uh, I mean, everybody can produce materials and uh, uh, follow the, the right pages with the people on the ground. Um, I mean, we didn't speak much about also the people who were on the ground and doing the lives. Uh, for example, if we speak about uh, the Kurds uh, um, family uh, and, and others who, who created really, um, waves of, of solidarity by just like filming what's happening and and uh, this is what's so so powerful um so i think we all have uh, the role in this and uh, and documenting and sharing uh, um, just simply follow uh, the people who are on the ground and uh, share it with you with, with your surrounding with your cycles that would be really important thank you nadim absolutely um continue to center those voices radica yeah, I just want to echo Nadim's words. Keep speaking out. Don't feel intimidated. Um, if you are censored, contact Hamle. I just want to say Hamle has been an incredible resource. Uh, people contact us about social media censorship. We're like, call Hamle. <laughs> so we're really thankful that they're there. Um, and, and contact us as well for, for other kinds of censorship. We're there. We have your backs. Um, yeah, don't be afraid. Keep, keep speaking out. It's so important. Thank you, Radhika and Diala. Yeah, nothing to add. I mean, these are all great suggestions, like particularly not if you're in the US and if you're at an academic institution, which I think a lot of the folks in this audience are, um, it's really important to have these discussions and not be chilled and not be um, sort of not be taken by a lot of the sort of boogeyman language that is thrown around and out there. So really big thanks to um, Kendra and the whole team for hosting this event. It's rare, like for, we're seeing a bit of a crossover finally where Palestine and the issues affecting Palestinian advocacy are kind of coming into and being put on agendas of folks who haven't historically paid attention. And I think that's an incredibly important development. Um, and I hope that it's not fleeting. So um, symposiums, law review articles in the legal academic context is really important um, as well as everywhere else, like in your workplaces, right? Um, so that's the best way to sort of counteract some of the siloing of this issue from many of the other important human rights and civil liberties issues that we all talk about um, so regularly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nadim, Radhika, Diala, uh, wonderful colleagues and amazing perspective. Uh, I'll just say everyone, you have a role here. So we can't tell you exactly you know, what your role is, but you need to do some digging and, and thinking and strategizing and figuring out how you can contribute because your voice uh, and your action is necessary. With that being said, I'm going to hand it back over to Kendra. Kendra, thank you so much to you uh, and the Institute for Representative First Amendment. Well, thank you so much. I feel like I uh, was uh, clapping and, you know, emoji hearting and, you know, all of those things. Uh, so thank you so much to, to our incredible panelists, uh, to our ASL interpreters. And finally, um, to my colleagues, Jazjak Kaur and uh, Sybil Gellin, who uh, uh, did a lot of the behind the scenes work. Um, I, they would, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to tell you that in addition to finding uh, the handles for our amazing panelists, 
um, and their organizations. You can follow us on Twitter um, and uh, subscribe to our newsletter so you can find out about more of our events. But thank you ever so much, everyone. And, and um, yeah, solidarity with those folks in Palestine who are continuing to speak out. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.